Hello everybody and welcome back to another Addicted Fishing tutorial. Today we're giving you a smorgasbord of knowledge on bead fishing. We realize it's been a while since we came at you with an in-depth bead tutorial, so today we're showing you everything from the butt of the rod to the end of the hook on everything you need to know about catching a fish on a floated bead. So stick around for this one, your fishing life just might depend on it. So right out the gate, we're gonna talk about one of the most important factors in bead fishing, and that is the type of rod that you're gonna choose. It is very, very necessary to have a long rod for fishing this sort of setup. Number one reason for using a long rod is for the technique that you need to use while fishing this setup. That we'll talk about more in a minute. But secondly, it's the castability. A lot of the times when we fish a bead, we use a fairly long leader. So you need to have a little bit longer rod to make it easy to cast the setup out into the river. The rod that I'm gonna be using today is an Okuma 10.6 Guide Select Pro. Any rod from a nine foot nine model that they have, which I have here next to me, or the 10 foot six model is what you want for fishing any style of float setup. We love Okuma. There's a lot of different rod companies out there to use, but my favorite is this 99 or this 106 Guide Select Pro model by Okuma. The line rating on this one is six to 12 pound. Why I want that six to 12 pound line rating is for the flexibility and the soft tip of that rod. When I'm mending my line, when I'm making my cast, I want a rod that has kind of a noodly tip. And as you can see here behind me, this thing is pretty floppy. And you guys will see more as I go into the technique style of fishing of why that's so important. But having a softer tip rod, one will make it easier to cast, two will make it easier to manage your line. So paired on this rod on the 10.6 Okuma Guide Select is my Okuma C40 Kaimar Reel. Anything of a C40 or a 3000 series or a 4000 series reel of any brand is the style of reel that you want. The reason we go with a three or a 4000 series or 30 or 40 series reel is the size and the amount of line that you can have on your reel. I like a 40 series reel because you get just a few more yards of line on it, which might come in handy given one, you catch a big fish or two, you're fishing a long drift where you're stuck in a single spot and you need to get your line way out there. So a C30 or a C40 reel I think is mandatory for any style of float fishing a bead. Second most important factor of your setup when you're fishing a bead is your line that you choose. What I have here on mine is a 65 pound Addicted Enforcer braid. Some of you may think that's a little too heavy, but you'll see the importance of it as we turn around and start fishing later on in this tutorial. Anywhere from a 40 pound up to about a 60 pound line is what I really, really prefer to use because of the flotation of that braided line. Braided line is a must in this case. Unless you're in the Midwest or an area where you have very, very cold and sub-freezing temperatures, that is the only time I like to switch to a monofilament or a fluorocarbon line. But if I have my choice, I'm using a 65 Addicted Enforcer braid line made by Tough Line. So going down the line and getting further into the meat and potatoes of this setup is going to be my bumper line. And my bumper line is the line that I'm going to attach to the end of my braided line. The reason this is so important is because you want that line that will actually slide through your bobber, go down through the water column and actually sink. The point of me using such a heavy braided line is so that it floats, which is counterintuitive to getting my presentation down and to in front of the fish. So my personal favorite is going with a 15 pound tough line fluorocarbon line on the end of my braided line. And I'm gonna show you right now how we attach that. So the proper length of bumper line is gonna really depend on what style of water and how big of river that you are fishing. I try to think of the biggest and deepest hole that I'm gonna fish throughout the day, and then I'm gonna make my bumper that length and no longer. A lot of times it can be a little bit tougher to cast, and again, this line sinks. So if you have too much of this fluorocarbon line above your bobber as you're fishing your drift, that line's gonna sink down and counteract your floating line, which is your braid. So what I like to do is think about the day when I'm fishing. How deep is the deepest hole? Today we're only gonna be fishing about a six to a 10 foot deep hole, so that's all my bumper that I'm gonna go. I'm gonna take two arm lengths, which is gonna be about 12 foot for me. There's six, there's 12, and let's go two more for good luck. I'm gonna cut my line off my spool, making sure I do not litter any on the river. And then I'm gonna grab my braided line and I'm gonna join these things. So the next step is coming up with a unifying knot of your braided line and your fluorocarbon line. Personally, I like to say only use the knot that you're best at tying. There are certain ones that are rated heavier tension than others when it comes to a uni knot. But personally, I like to tie the one that I am best at and I think that is the strongest knot of all. The one that you've practiced, the one that your fingers tie best, and the one that works for you when you're out on the river on a rainy cold day and your hands are all soggy. So what I like to tie is a blood knot. There's probably four different styles of knots that you can use for unifying your two lines. And here on Addicted Fishing, under tips and tricks for salmon and steelhead, there's lots of knot tying tutorials so check that one out but today I'm going to show you the blood knot. So the blood knot consists of taking your braided line in your left hand and your fluorocarbon line in your right hand and laying them across each other 
fluorocarbon line on top. Since I've made this X, I'm gonna grab with my index finger and my thumb and holding the rest of the line with my other fingers, and I'm gonna make seven wraps of the braided line around my fluorocarbon. There it is. Now that I have that tied like this, I'm holding both ends of that knot. I'm gonna pinch the entire twist of that blood knot. I'm gonna run my braided line towards the camera, away from my body, around the fluorocarbon line and back into the bottom of my index finger and thumb. Now that I've done so, I'm gonna take my fluorocarbon line and make seven wraps on my braided line the opposite direction. Once I've done so, I let go of my braided line. I use the hole that's created by the two lines crossing each other, go back away from my body again towards the camera and gently pull these two tight. As you can see, I have both ends kind of pinching down on each other at this point. Most important part of all, get your knot wet with a little bit of spit or river water. Let both ends go and gently start to pull the two of these together. I want to make sure that each of them are starting to grab. Not one of the tag ends is slipping through. I'm going to give it a little more moisture and I'm going to pull it tight. And there it is. A good way to tell that you did your blood knot correctly is if your line goes opposite directions out of the knot. You want your braided line out the bottom or the top and your fluorocarbon line out the other end. And that is one of the most important parts of tying this knot. If you don't have that, cut it off, take the time to practice this knot and retie it until you get it right. Okay, step number two in my float setup is how I'm gonna stop my bobber from sliding up and down my line and regulate the depth that I'm fishing my bead at, which is extremely important when float fishing a bead. You learning to fish a bead little? You watch the tutorial? Okay, bobbers are next. No, nope, doesn't like it. Should I use the clear float or the foam float? Which one? Clear or foam? Nope, clear it is. I'm gonna reach into my handy dandy box here and pull out one of the rubber bobber stops. Now these little Bowmac bobber stops are by far my favorite. They come in different line sizes. These are the two to four pound. I like to use the tighter rubber on my line so that it doesn't slide around so easy and it tends to not wear out quite as much. And also, these are these nice bright red fluorescent colors. So as I'm reeling back in and I need to grab my line and change my depth, I can see it well and I can move my line around quickly and get back in the water. So the way these work is we have these nice loops on the end of the rubber bobber stop, as you can see here. I'm gonna take my fluorocarbon Oh, come on hands. Go through the bottom of the loop, identify which one I have, put about three or four inches of line through the end of it, have that line fold over in my hand just like you see here, and then I'm going to push that bead and that stop up onto my line over my little fold over here, and you can see how nice and tight that is on there, so that's not going to move unless I manually do it with my hands, and there we have it. There's what stops my bobber and a little tiny bead to get me started. After I add that little bead in my bobber stuff, I like to use either a corky, a big orange corky, or a bigger eight to 10 mil bead above my bobber so that I can make sure that I have no tangles when I cast. If I see my bead or my corky floating away from my float, I know to reel back in and correct it. So I like to add this little bead, or again, the corky above the bobber before I actually slide my float on. All right, on to our float choice. Now this is a big one for people. And a lot of times your float choice is gonna depict on what kind of water that you're fishing. The two that I like to go with most is either a foam bead float, there's bead masters, there's these Bomac floats, or a Bomac clear drift or one of the clear drift brand bobbers. I really do prefer a lot of times the clear drift bobber because given the situation, given the conditions, it's a nice unintimidating presentation and the fish don't see it much. The foam floats can be a very good choice. One, because you can see them very well in the distance if you're stuck on the bank and casting. And two, they have a lot of flotation to them because they are foam. So they tend to carry the bead through the traffic in the water, through those boulder gardens and off the bottom and keep your presentation going through the strike zone, sometimes better than the clear floats. But both of these set up the exact same way on your line, but today I'm going with the clear drift option. Now the way to float that you're gonna choose depends again on the style of water. Today we're fishing with your typical about three, Yep. That's what Dasher used to do. He's copying Dash, man. Hmm. Poor old man. 
The size of float that I like to use for fishing a floating bead is usually about a half to a three quarter ounce bobber. Anything bigger than that is just too cumbersome. There's no need to have a bobber that big and it can at times affect your drift because the bobber has so much flotation and your bead is getting pulled along too quickly. But we'll talk more about that in a second. So half ounce bobbers are usually my go-to weight when setting up the bead fishing setup. Set up, set up, set up. So what makes this work obviously is that inline bobber stop that I just added. This way I can adjust my depth throughout my presentation and fish all types of water. So I have my bobber stop and my two beads on my main line already. I slide my float on, give myself about a foot or a foot or two to work with, and then I'm gonna add just a snap swivel setup. Now you can use a three-way swivel here with a little dropper clevis, but one of my biggest pet peeves is having too much stuff in my tackle box. So just your typical inline barrel swivel and clevis setup work just fine. And this is a number five, so a pretty big one, or at least that's what I'm told. I'm gonna go my main line, which is my heavier line, on the side that I'm gonna be adding my weight. I'm gonna do my seven wraps, my typical fisherman's knot. I go through the eye of the swivel, make seven wraps and back through the eye that I created. Just your normal clinch knot. Wet your knots always guys, hashtag wet your knots. And there we go, there's half of our setup. Now it's on to our sinker or our lead setup that we're gonna put on here. It's very, very imperative to pair the right amount of lead with the style of float that you're using. So today I'm using a half ounce float. So I'm either gonna one, cut a piece of pencil lead like I have here, and I'm gonna show you guys the technique that I do that. But the second option is having these handy dandy Dave Tangle Free stick weights in the half ounce version. I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna add it right on to my snap swivel that comes on my swivel setup here, and there we go. Little trick of the trade, I take my pliers, I like to pinch down the little metal sleeve that it has around that so that that thing doesn't come flying off while I'm fishing throughout the day. And now for what life's all about, leaders and beads. So before we get to bead sizes and colors, we're gonna talk about leader choice when fishing a float setup. Depending on your given river, your given conditions, and where you're at in the country, is gonna depict what style of line and leader that you're gonna use. Today, because we have this beautiful steelhead green water, we're in the Pacific Northwest with big aggressive fish. I'm gonna go with as heavy as I can get away with. So I'm gonna go with a 12 pound tough line fluorocarbon line. So given the fact that you're in the Midwest with super clear water and tough conditions, or out here in the Pacific Northwest and you have low clear water, it's gonna depict how light you go on your leader line. Again, I have perfect conditions behind me, so I'm gonna go as heavy as possible, but this setup can be done exactly like I'm setting it up here, all the way down to even like a four pound fluorocarbon line or a monofilament line. Monofilament tends to work just as good as a fluorocarbon line in this setup, but what I find is with the fluorocarbon, it is ultra clear and very hard for the fish to see. So next we're gonna talk about leader length, which is very important for float fishing a bead. It really depends on the size of bead that you're using to how long you want your leader. So I'm gonna start off this setup with about a 12 millimeter bead up to a four and we'll talk about those here in a second. But my go-to length usually is about five to five and a half feet. So I'm gonna go from my left pec out to the end of my arm and then I'm gonna make my first cut. The key to the length of your leader is really depicted on how far you want your bead away from your weight setup. Sometimes the fish can be a little shy of that stick weight and or the pencil lead that you have on your line. So I want at least usually over about three to three and a half to a length of about six feet being the maximum length when I'm using my 12 pound test. So I'm gonna put that 12 pound right on the end of my other swivel here. Typical clinch knot again, don't wanna to be too fancy. Hashtag wet your knots and pull her tight. All right, drum roll please. Time for bead talk. Now there is such thing out there as a bead nerd, and I can tend to be one of them. Why I say bead nerd is because there are so many different skews, different sizes, different color, and different types of beads out there on the market for you guys, which can be very confusing at times. To me, each and every one of them work. Nine times out of 10, any lure you see on the shelf or any bead you see on the shelf at your tackle store has caught a fish before. That's why that color exists. So having a good range, but sticking within a realm of practicality is very important. The three types of bead out there that are the most relevant in my opinion are one, the original hard bead. Two, the soft bead and three, the in-betweener, the incognito bead. So the first beads we're gonna talk about are the ones that started it all, and that is your hard bead. What sets each style of bead apart is the density of the bead and really the presentation ultimately. A lot of times the hard bead need to be pegged to your line so that they stay in place so that you get a good float. So I'm gonna show you exactly how we do that to be the most effective and keep these beads away from your hook. And we'll explain the importance of that here when we talk about our hook size choice. 
So if you learn anything from this tutorial today, it's one trick of the trade that we've been using a lot over the last couple of years. My man Cameron Black is the one that turned me on to it. And if again, you take anything from this tutorial, it's using these little guys right here, our bead best friend. So what I have here is my glass bead assortment kit. And having an assortment of these isn't that important. A lot of times we wanna use the smallest and the clearest one that we have possible, and that's this little guy right here. So let me open this pack without ruining my day and get one of these bad boys out and show you guys. Okay, careful, careful. Nobody panic, nobody panic. Nobody make any sudden movements either, please. Oof, oof, oof. Okay, oh, cracked it. So what we have here is a tiny, tiny glass bead. And why this is so important is because this little bead is what's gonna keep any of our styles of beads from sliding all the way down our line to the end of our hook, which is the worst place of all to have your bead. So what I'm first gonna do is add my bead to my line. And we're gonna talk about size and styles and colors of beads here in just a minute after we get through our setup portion. But I'm gonna take my 14 mil bead, I'm gonna put my line right through that bad boy let it freely float on my line, and then grab my glass bead and somehow get that 12 pound test through that tiny hole. Success. Now it's onto the hooks. Next and most important choice in my bead setup is gonna be the size and style of hook that I use. Now I'm, I'm not just doing a hopeless sales pitch here, but we worked on this hook for a long time. And in my opinion, the best option for any style of bead fishing at all is our Addicted Advantage bead hook made by Mustad. Now the shape, bend, and point of this hook is what makes it so special, and I'll show you guys that right here. And this again is a hook that we researched and tested for three years here at Addicted to make sure it was perfect for this style of fishing. So I have a size three. We come in four different sizes with our Addicted B hooks. We have size one, which is a little bit bigger, something you're gonna use for like a style of bait. We have size two, which is honestly, in my opinion, probably the perfect size of all. Size three, which is a little bit smaller, and size four for your smaller beads, your eight mils, your 10 mils, and again, that light Lighter, more stealth presentation, but today I'm going with a size two. Now there's many, many ways to tie this hook onto your line. Some people like to use an egg loop or some sort of bait loop on their line, but, but the way I like to tie these and the knot that I like to use because of the way that it holds the hook, and I'll show you that in a second, is just again, your simple fisherman's clinch knot. Seven wraps. Back through the eye. Hashtag wet your knot. And pull her tight. Now, I'm gonna show you where this little glass bead comes into play. I'm gonna slide this thing up my line to about three fingers. I like the three finger rule here. I got about one, two, three fingers above my hook. And why that is so imperative is because if my 14 mil bead actually slides down all the way to my hook, you can see how little hook gap there is presented. If that fish bites that bead, that hook can slide right through their mouth without being touched. If I have that bead away from my hook, the fish bites the bead, the hook goes into the corner of the mouth. Perfect, every single time. And that is what makes the best bead hookup. Beads are notorious for losing fish, so allowing this setup to work the way it does, so the fact that that glass bead sits on your setup the way it does and keeps your bead away from your hook the whole time is what makes it so darn effective. The way I'm gonna keep this thing in the position I want it is I'm gonna put that bead again three fingers away. I'm gonna do a double overhand knot around the hook, just two wraps. I'm gonna slide that back over the hook, making sure it's in the correct position. Wet that knot a little bit, and then pull it tight right around the bead. And that's all you need, everybody. Simple as that. I find very, very seldom, unless there's some sort of damage to the line, or you're using something like an eight or a four pound test, this is a very, very strong and sturdy knot around that bead, and it doesn't break as much as some of you might think out there. My second to last step before starting to fish is I'm gonna double down on my bead peg. I want that thing to stay right where it is above that glass bead. And if I don't peg that bead the rest of the way, it's gonna float freely up and down my line, and at times won't be sitting close enough to my hook to actually hook the fish if a fish therefore grabs my bead. You can use either a toothpick or one of these clear brads bead stops. And these are probably the less intrusive on your line. What happens a lot of time if you use toothpicks is it can tend to damage your line. I'm a big toothpick fan, but today we're gonna show you how to use these. And it's very simple. All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slide that little rubber tube up through the middle of my bead, just like that. I'm gonna pull that tight. Sorry, mom. Pull that tight. Take the other end, making sure that I save the other end of that bead stop, and I'm not littering. 
and there you have it. That bead stuck to the line, but not so much that you can't move it around and add scent and so on and so forth. Now I'm gonna take that, move it all the way down to my glass bead and we're ready to fish. Now one last but very important step is adding a little bit of extra weight to my leader line. The reason I use such a long leader, and this I wouldn't even call a long leader, this is about four and a half to five feet, is so that I get the most natural presentation out of the bead as I possibly can. This thing should look like an egg floating down the river. That is the idea of fishing a bead, is that it has a very natural and a very organic look as it goes through the water column in front of those fish. So to do that, if I try to just cast this out with just my lead, the lead will go to the bottom, the bead will float up because these things are buoyant, especially when we start getting into talking soft beads. So the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna take my hook and bring it down to my lead. And that spot that is right in between up here at the axis, I'm gonna take a split shot, usually a size seven to a size 10, pretty small. I'm gonna take my size six split shot, open it up, lay my line into it, make sure that it is right halfway in between my bead and my hook. Take my pliers and give it just a nice soft squeeze to make sure it stays in position. And there we have it. We have my lead, which will be sitting just off the bottom, my split shot, which will take the bead down into that strike zone and give us that nice, organic, natural drift, unwashed and ready to fish. So now that we've covered the single hard bead on your line, we're gonna talk about the graduated method, and that is a double bead, where applicable. Again, some places in the country, some of the rivers that you guys out there might be fishing might only be single hook regulations. But if not, a double bead is a very, very effective way of covering more water and finding more fish ultimately, because without saying it, we have two different presentations on our line, which is one of my favorite ways to fish. Now this is very simple add. All we're gonna do is take our size two hook and we're gonna add a piece of line with a normal clinch knot to the end of it, just like so. I'm gonna go right on the end of the hook shank using the curve of that hook as my little pendulum. I'm gonna take and make seven wraps again, just a normal fisherman's clinch knot. Run my hook or run my line back through the hole I created. Hashtag wet your knots. And there it is. That's how we attach our second leader line. And my rule of thumb is if I'm running two beads, my bottom bead is always going to be a smaller diameter of bead than my top bead. So what I have here is a 14 millimeter bead. And 14 mil is about as high in diameter as most of these hard beads will go. Anything bigger than that, it will get a little heavy. It doesn't fish quite the same. And you're going to want to go into the soft bead realm, which we're going to talk about here in just a second. So when adding that second bead, the rule of thumb is always have a smaller bead. And today I'm going to go with a 10 mil bead and this is very simple and so now instead of using the glass bead because i'm using a smaller bead a 10 mil an 8 mil or a 6 i'm actually just going to wrap my line around the bead with the same knot as i use to tie my glass bead in on my top leader so what i'm going to do here i have my naked leader down below my first hook i'm going to put my 10 mil bead on my line just like this and today i just chose another trout bead kind of a model bead with a blood dot and here I have about two feet. You don't want too long of a leader on your dropper line because it will cause tangles when you cast. And that's one thing I'm gonna talk about once we hit the water with this setup is how to properly cast and how to properly lay out your line so that you avoid tangles and effectively fish with each cast. Now that I have that two feet, I have my bead freely flowing back and forth. I'm gonna take a size four hook because I've gone with a smaller bead, just like we talked before when choosing your hook choice. And I'm gonna go with the size four bead, which is the smallest addicted advantage bead that we make. And I'm gonna tie your typical clinch knot once again. Seven wraps. Back through the hole, hashtag wet. And there we have it. So next and final step to adding my second bead. And again, this works only with the smaller beads, eight mil, six mil, up to about 10 mil. If I get any bigger, I wanna go with my glass bead setup to stop that bigger bead. The reason being because you can't get a very tight wrap and a very nice presentation out of wrapping your line around that big bead. So I'm gonna run down here. Again, going with the three finger rule, I'm gonna get my bead to that three finger gap, do two overhand knots once again over my hook point, just like so, and slowly pull it back onto that bead. And look at that, perfect placement, nice smooth edges on that knot so that you're not getting any kinks or abrasing your line whatsoever, which is gonna cause you to lose or break fish. And there we have it, there is our second bead setup. We have our weight, about a foot and a half down to our first split shot, another foot and a half down to our 14 mil with my glass bead, size two hook, two feet down to my eight mil bead, 10 mil bead, and down to, of course, my size four hook because I'm using that smaller bead. Let's go fish it. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, so in front of us here, here we have the perfect style of steelhead run. <laughs> the beauty of a bead is that it can be fished in every single type of water. I can fish it from dead stagnant water that's barely moving with a tidal influence to a rapid where the water is moving so fast you don't even think you could possibly fish there. What I have in front of me is your quintessential steelhead water. We got three to about eight feet deep, nice boulders spread out throughout the run, walking speed, and a nice flat surface to the water. This is where I wanna to try to identify where to find fish. If you guys wanna learn more about how to actually read water and find fish, there's other tutorials. Marlin just actually came out with one recently that really breaks down the dynamic of finding good water for steelhead. So reference some of the other videos we have here on our YouTube channel, and then come back to this one for these bead setups. But I'm gonna go through it quickly here and give you the gist of how we fish this. The biggest question I'm asked when it comes to float fishing of any type is how do you know you're on the bottom. The thing about this bead fishing is you don't necessarily want your main weight on the bottom. So therefore, when I start at any hole, I'm always going to start as rule of thumb at about three feet deep on my leader length, especially if it's in a run like this, where I have that distance of depth where I'm going from deep to shallow throughout the run. The best thing in the world is finding an aggressive fish that'll come to your bead and eat it because we all know those ones are the most fun. So a typical rule of thumb for me when fishing a new hole is I always start shallow and work my way deep. And I'm gonna try to show you as I fish through here what it looks like to find bottom. So initially I'm gonna start with my three foot depth. And what matters here most is your angles of casting and how you approach the hole. My big, big, big rule that I preach in all of our addicted tutorials is how we start close, middle, and far. So what I mean by close is I walk up to the run here in front of me. The first place that I can identify bottom is about two rod lengths out, about 20 feet out in front of me. I see a dark, deep green pool and no bottom from here down to the end of the tail out. That's where I want to start my first cast. So I'm going to do just that. Always starting with my shoulders pointing down river, line going up at 45 degrees on my first cast, about 20 feet out or so, I'm gonna bring it back into the first seam that I can't see bottom, and I'm gonna start my fish. And I'm gonna start my drift. As you can see so far, I have a nice straight taut line to my bobber. I'm not affecting my bobber, I'm not pulling it towards me like you see here. My line isn't down below my bobber, pulling it through the run. I have a nice steady drift. My line is above the bobber, back towards me with no pressure on that bobber. About halfway through my run, I'm gonna open my bail and I'm gonna let that line freely float. A small tip I like to give people when letting line out is not to let the current and the bobber's resistance pull your line out of your reel and just holding it here. You have a 10 foot rod. I'm gonna point my tip down at the water, keep my bail open, point my rod up to 90 degrees above my head, and then I'm gonna close my bail and let that length of line that I just let out fish. That way, if the bobber goes down, I can be as quick as possible to grab the handle of my reel, start reeling, and apply pressure to that fish. Now that I've made one cast through the run, my second cast is gonna be about 10 feet farther than I had just initially casted my first cast. So, I started here on the inside, I'm gonna open my bail, look out to where I wanna cast, and send her flying. One very important thing when casting a bead or any sort of long leader setup is to try to stop your bobber and your bead setup in the air before it touches the water. Why that's so imperative is so that we avoid tangles. Because we have this leader, we have the split shot, and we have all this bead setup, at times if you let that line pile up on itself, you'll get tangles, you'll get wraps, and you won't actually be fishing throughout your drift. So what I'll show you here is one of the most important parts of bead fishing, and that is stopping the line in the air. I'm gonna cast. Make sure I'm, I'm clear behind me. I'm gonna go out, identify where I want my cast. Three quarters of the way through the cast, I'm gonna stop the line with my hand, make that bobber come tight, make that bead go to the end of my line, and it all lays out flat and sexy on the water, which will allow me to have a tangle-free drift. So now that I've made my halfway cast across the river, I'm gonna do that close, middle, far strategy. Here comes my far cast. And this is where stopping your line and creating that nice flat layout is so important. Because when you put a lot of effort into your cast and it goes a long way, that's when that bead and that bobber have time to do the pendulum effect and ultimately wrap. So make sure to stop your line. And now our line management comes into play. You can see how I have a big belly of line down below my bobber. That's not what I want when fishing this sort of setup. So what I'm gonna do to mend, I'm gonna grab my line, I'm gonna lift it up, Make sure to mend all the way to the top of your bobber. Don't half the mend. The process I use to get the proper mending in a cast is always casting upriver at 45 degrees, never higher and never lower. What I initially do is I let that belly form below the bobber so that I have some line to mend. What I always preach is mend at the first third the half and the three quarters of the drift. Most complete drifts usually do not need to be mended more than three times given the style of water. So I'll show you what I mean by that right now. I'm gonna cast at 45, 
stop my line. I'm gonna let this belly initially form. So here's the first third of my drift. I'm gonna lift my line high, amend it to the top of the bobber, and I'm gonna let it start to fish. Because I have that perfect point of contact, I have line on the water, I don't even need to have my bail open for security. Here's my half of drift. I'm gonna lift my line up again, fix that belly down below my bobber, and let it continue fishing. Now I'm getting down towards the three quarters of my drift. My drift is almost over. So I'm gonna lift my rod tip high at 90 degrees, make my mend all the way, and continue that fishing with my bail open and my hand close to the reel. Now that I've made my close middle far cast, I know I haven't hit bottom because I had a vertical bobber the entire time. I'm gonna give myself a little bit of depth. A good rule to live by is never add more than about a foot of depth at a time. There's no reason to go extreme on your bobber depth changes. We wanna work our way down in the water column because those fish aren't always right on the bottom. Sometimes they may be migrating, sometimes they may see your bead and come up for it, which usually poses for a better hookup. So I've made my three close middle far casts. I'm gonna add myself about a foot of depth and I'm gonna see if I can find the bottom. I'm gonna repeat my process now, start with my close cast. So you can see now, my bobber is still straight up and down. It's not showing any tension against the bottom of the river. I'm not dragging whatsoever. And my bobber is still sitting vertical. What this means is that I still have not gone deep enough to actually touch the bottom. You see, as I start making my way through the drift, right about here, my bobber's leaning a little bit. It's starting to move around. That's because my split shot is touching the bottom, which is the perfect drift. Now I know that I'm at the proper depth. Now a quick example of what too deep looks like. So here we go. Now I'm gonna to be too deep to where my main weight is actually touching the bottom. And you'll see instantly the different characteristics and how that float is floating. So you can tell already, I'm, I have a lot of movement in my bobber. It has a very steep pitch pointing down river because that main weight is dragging and not just my split shot. My line is starting to candy cane down below my bobber and I'm getting again, a lot of movement out of my bobber due to the resistance of the weight touching the bottom. Now this is how you know you're too deep and you don't need to go any further in your setup. And now there is no need to go any deeper with your bobber stop because you found the bottom of the river. Okay, everybody, now because we have a still a lot to cover in this tutorial here, I'm gonna cut to a quick clip of what it looks like when your bobber goes down and it is actually a fish. Look at it. Look at that, everybody. What a specimen. On to the double bead setup. And really what I'm gonna show you guys here isn't the same tactics as I was fishing, but more stressing on how to stop your line and lay this bead setup out so that you get a perfect drift and you don't have tangles. 
we really, really, really need to accentuate stopping our line in the air. And properly doing this comes with how you start your cast. I'm gonna turn and lock my eyes on exactly the spot that I wanna cast 45 degrees up river. I'm gonna make a very soft and delicate rainbow cast. And what I mean by rainbow cast is very soft and I'm gonna leave my tip at about 45 degrees over the river when I stop my cast. Now that I'm safe behind me and I know both beads aren't tangled, I'm gonna let her fly, keeping my tip high, stop my line about 15 feet before it's to its destination and make sure that those two beads lay out flat and flat onto the surface of the water. I always say if you see your stuff pile up, if you can tell your beads are tangled in the air, don't risk it, don't waste your time, reel in and make sure you get that perfect cast when you're fishing this double bead setup. So what I like to do also with my leaders, the last little piece, um, is I like to put these on a, on a leader board. You get these at fishing, you can get all this stuff, pretty much everything that you see me use here today, other than some of my custom hard beads that I do, uh, you can get on the addicted.fishing website. So I'm gonna take, use this leaderboard, just take the hook in first. And this is a great way to constantly be ready. I got my split shot already on there. All I'm gonna do if I break off is grab one of these, throw it on my, on my swivel and be fishing. And what I like to do to protect these in my bag is put them in a little Ziploc. So I'll do a gallon Ziploc, see I got my jigs in there. I got some extra beads rolling around in there. Cause that's, oh, wow, those are fishy right there. Typical bead guy. Ooh, look at my beads. Check out my beads, guys. Okay. And then I zip that bad boy up and I have basically just a nice little protective layer over my, my leader so they're not getting messed up in my bag. Let's go fishing.